Okay. So, yes, today we're off to Greece. We're going to be looking at the same things we do every Tuesday, but obviously, as you know by now, they end up pretty different. We're going to have a look at the physical geography. We're going to have a look at the wildlife. We're going to see what the government of Greece is like. We're then going to have a look at everyone's favorite parts, uh, the GDP per capita. Woo! And then we're going to go down and look at some Greek culture. Um, so, a sigh. Whoa, everyone loves the GDP per capita. Um, hmm. Oh, some people like the animals too. Okay, whatever. You do you. I prefer a good graph to an animal. What have animals ever done for us, eh? Hmm. Now, um, today our, our main focus is actually going to be we're going to we're going to we've got a, quite a big focus on the culture today but i think our main focus is going to be the physical geography which we haven't focused on for a little while actually so that should be fun um but let's start at having a look where greece is in the world so if we zoom in here ooh, there's greece down there um greece is quite a an amazing place it's historically very important as i'm sure we're all aware by now just because of the amount of time that i spend banging on about it um but today greece is um this sort of hanging country down here uh it's on a level with italy as you can see there or at least southern italy um and greece is made up of lots and lots and lots of tiny islands you know it has a has a big mainland as well but there are lots of tiny islands uh, as part of greece if we bring our Greek map here a little bit more uh, clearly, this is a modern map of Greece, and you can see it borders Turkey. We've got Macedonia, we've got Albania, we've got Bulgaria, all these countries around it. Um, and you can see that the capital of Greece is none other than Athens, the same place that's been an important city in Greece for thousands of years. Now, where I am, Mount Olympus, hello. Um, that's up here in the north of Greece, so the highest point. We'll have a look at that a bit more when we look at the physical geography. Um, oh, people still coming in. Um, ah, look, so Kyle has been to Turkey and Italy, but not to Greece. So you've been either side, but not to it. That's quite cool. Yes. Um, uh, yes, on, on the Iris Express, that would work. I, I, I see that someone in the chat has got a Greek name. That's pretty cool. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot re read the Greek alphabet. Uh, um, so, uh, that's Greece uh, when it comes to the map. It's in Europe. It's uh, The sea all around it is the Mediterranean. So a nice warm sea, which is why we're going to focus on sea creatures in our wildlife section today. There we go. Um, but let's go and take a closer look at some of the physical geography. So... We need to come up this way, don't we? Uh, if I can get there. There we go. All right, so we just saw a map of Greece um, laid out with some of the place names on it. Here's our relief map. Uh, ah, Rookie has been to Ant Antalya. Ooh, that's quite cool. Um, and Lucy's name is Zoe. In uh, oh, <laughs> Lucy is not Lucy. Lucy is Zoe. And Zoe is Greek. That's very cool. I like that. Um, <laughs> ah, and in the chat, someone is called Calamera, which is good morning in Greek. Ah, I like it. This is good. <laughs> um, now, here we've got our... Uh, oh, uh, here we've got our relief map. So if we remember, a relief map shows how high the ground is. So Greece is quite a mountainous and hilly country, as we can see from all the dark brown on it. Um, we've got a great big ridge of mountains that's going all the way up, getting more, getting bigger as we leave Greece to the north. Um, but there are these low-lying areas of green that we can see, especially around the coast. Um, and we can see all these tiny islands all scattered about uh, both around Greece and below Greece here, um, which means that Greece is going to be somewhere that has really important links to the sea. If your lowland is coastal, then that's where you're going to be building your towns and cities. Generally, towns and cities get built on the lowland. It's more difficult to do it in the mountains uh, and also diff more difficult to find resources. So we find towns and cities on the lowland around Greece. Um, which usually means that they are coastal cities, which means that they are going to be pretty closely linked to the ocean, or at least, well, to the Mediterranean Sea. Um, uh, how do you write all this? I don't know how you should write all this, Kyle. Um, 
maybe in Greek. That would be good. Yeah. Ah, good morning, Iona. It's good to see that you are home. That's amazing. Ah, congratulations. Um, uh, oh, I, someone's asking, can I breathe on the top of Mount Olympus? I can. It's only something like 2,000 meters odd high. You know, the air's a bit thin, but it's not terrible. I'm not up Everest here, you know. Um, it, it, it's, it's thin, but it's okay. I'm managing. You know, I've got the lungs of a demigod. I'll be all right. Um, so uh, what is the, the island at the bottom? This is the island of Crete down here, which is part of Greece as well. Yes. Um, there we are. At least that's the main island. There are loads of islands and they all, of course, have their own names. Hmm. Now, let's take a, a closer look at Mount Olympus. Here's Mount Olympus peeking out of the clouds here. Uh, the tallest mountain in Greece. Um, and it's famous probably because of the ancient religion. If we were in ancient Greece, we certainly wouldn't be at the top of it like I am. Um, we certainly probably would very rarely see the top of it because it would be covered in clouds. So you can, it's easy to imagine how people would think that there were gods up there and palaces maybe up beyond the clouds at the top of this mountain that you know the humans cannot ever get to. No ancient Greek ever managed to climb Mount Olympus, as far as I know, um, hmm. unless you believe some myths, I guess. Uh, as far as I know, they wouldn't have been able to get up there. So it would have been a very spooky and surreal kind of place looking up at that great big mountain and imagining all kinds of creatures and gods living up there. Hmm. So this mountain is in the north of Greece. And, um, oh, Jay says there may be a Yeti up there. Oh, sorry, Kyle says there may be a Yeti up there. Potentially, I mean, a, a Greek Yeti, yes. Um, how do you spell it? That's a good question. Let me write Mount Olympus up here. So, oh, I've now managed to paint it blue. Oh dear. So, Mount Olympus. My O turned very round there, didn't it? Mount Olympus, cool. Hmm. Um, now, what I thought we'd focus on today, though, we're not going to focus on the mountains or the, the relief map. We're going to focus in our physical geography section on earthquakes, because I've had fun this morning um, researching Greek earthquakes, of which in recent days there have been a lot. In fact, here's my list of earthquakes that have happened in Greece so far today. Well, I say so far today, um, it hasn't quite updated. The last one here was registered at four o'clock this morning. Um, but you'll notice that in Greece, we have had, at time of uh, pr presentation here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten earthquakes in Greece um, since half past 12 last night. So it's rumbling around is our Greece at the moment. There's lots of earthquakes going on, lots of activity under the ground, which is quite cool. I found this really cool website that keeps you up to date with all the earthquakes in the world. And Greece is on there quite a lot today. Now, before you get too worried, these earthquakes are pretty small. Um, these earthquakes are barely noticeable, most of them. Um, having said that, there was quite a big one um, on Saturday. There was quite a large one, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, so we're going to use this as an excuse this morning to have a look at um, the effects that earthquakes can have and how earthquakes happen, what they are, why are these things happening in Greece, and uh, you know, especially why have, why have we already had 10 already today? Yeah. So let's take a look. Let's take a look over here at the Richter scale. Now this is a representation of the Richter scale. It doesn't go the whole way up, but I can give you a little bit of explanation here. Let me move my own face over here. Now we can see on our list of earthquakes for today, um, they are largely between magnitude two and magnitude three. Magnitude three is as big as it gets. Um, so far today. Um, yes, they're, they're all today, Kai. Yes, that's right. Um, they're all today. Um, now, uh, a magnitude zero earthquake is no earthquake at all. We are currently experiencing a magnitude zero earthquake. We cannot feel it because it does not exist. There you go. Easy. Um, now, a magnitude one earthquake, we also wouldn't notice. Yeah, it would be picked up by machines, um, machines that, that we use um, seismometers. Uh, they could pick up uh, a magnitude one earthquake, but humans wouldn't notice it. It wouldn't shake our houses. It wouldn't, you know, cause anything to fall over. It would just we wouldn't notice it. Yeah, it's too small. Um, oh, there's a good question from Helen and Rosebud. How, how tall is Mount Olympus? Let me find out exactly for you. Um, 
let me see. I believe it's over 2,000 meters tall, but let's have a look at the exact number. Mount Olympus is, hmm, let's see. It is 2,917 meters tall, so nearly 3,000 meters tall. It's a beast. There you are. Thank you, guy. Um, there you are. Hmm. Pretty tall mountain. Pretty tall mountain indeed. Um, so back to our Richter scale. Um, every step on the Richter scale means that the earthquake has become 10 times larger. So a, a number two on the Richter scale means that the earthquake is 10 times larger than a number one. A number three is 10 times larger than a number two. So you can see how they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Now, if we are hit by an, a magnitude two earthquake on the Richter scale, that means that maybe we're going to start noticing it now. Maybe things are going to, we're going to feel a rumble, maybe hear a bit of a, a rumble. It might be, you know, it might still be, depending on how, where it is exactly, you might still not notice it if you're just sort of wandering around in your day-to-day -day life. Maybe if you're sat next to something, maybe your glass of water or tea, a cup of tea on the table will start to shake a little bit, but probably not much. Um, so you probably miss most magnitude twos. And as we can see so far today in Greece, we've had, um, and these are, are mainly, um, out to sea it has to be said but in Greece we're looking at mainly somewhere around two yeah so these little earthquakes that have been rumbling all morning uh, since midnight they're pretty small earthquakes probably not been noticeable by most people but there has been a couple of uh, of three so at 320 and then again at 326 this morning there were two magnitude three earthquakes in Greece which means um, that at a magnitude three you're going to start noticing it Things are going to start, you know, in our little diagram here, we can see that the lampshade is starting to swing. Uh, maybe the cups on the table are starting to rock. Um, you know, it's still not massively worrying. Your house isn't going to fall down or anything. It's not, a, it's not a terrible thing to be happening. But it is, you know, it's noticeable for sure. Um, oh, Grace, we will, we will have a look at why there are so many in a minute. We'll have a look at the science behind that. Um, Yes, that all will become clear, hopefully. Um, to be fair, in Greece, earthquakes are happening quite often. You know, it's at a, at a space in the world where earthquakes are more common. We'll, we'll have a look. Um, now, if we go 10 times higher, if we were going to go to a magnitude 4 earthquake, that's when things start to get freaky. That's when things start to roll around on your table. The lamp shades are swinging pretty hard. You're going to notice a magnitude 4. If it goes up to 5, this is where your books start to fall off of the bookshelves. Um, possibly at the top of a, a magnitude 5, your bookshelf might fall over. Your cups and plates are falling off the shelves. Um, your foundations are starting to break up in your house if you haven't got a particularly well-built house anyway. Uh, your cups, instead of shaking on the table, are falling off the table. Number five is getting pretty big. Yeah. Oh, Eleanor, uh, because the, it, it says I felt it on some of these things because um, on this website, they want people to, who have been in the earthquake to click it and to put in their information about it. This website is trying to build up a big idea of what, what, how different earthquakes are. So yes, the ones that say I felt it, I believe they're the 3.2s. Um, you wouldn't bother putting that label on the twos because both people wouldn't feel it. Um, but if you had felt it, if you were living in Greece right now, you could click that button and tell the website what it was like so that they could start building up a database of, of the different types of earthquakes. Hmm. Ah, yes, uh, Jasper's mentioning in 2008, there was a, an earthquake of, uh, on a 5.2 in Nottingham. Yes, I, I was in Lincoln, I believe then, and I, it woke me up. Uh, Jasper says that his dad slept through it. It woke me up and I was a bit surprised. I can remember it was the middle of the night and I woke up and I thought, oh no, there's a ghost. There's a ghost moving things around in my room. And I was a bit annoyed, but I was pretty tired. So I just went back to sleep. And it wasn't until I woke up in the morning that I realized, hang on, probably wasn't a ghost because they're not real and also there was an earthquake probably more likely it was that yes so there you go um but yes we do get the odd earthquake here it's pretty rare but we do get them sometimes yeah no when you know in greece they're getting earthquakes a lot it's quite a normal thing um in britain it's very very rare <laughs> hello in greek iona <laughs> so um so if we go if we go 10 times bigger 
than a number five. If the number five is already knocking our bookshelves over and stuff, if we go 10 times bigger than that, that's when we start to go into real danger zone territory. We've got houses that are starting to crumble. You know, your, your bricks are falling off, your plaster's cracking off the walls. Maybe your tiles are falling off the roof. Um, your bookcase is well and truly over and you need to find somewhere safe to stand. Now you can see in this little diagram here, um, a safe place might be under a table because it's got strong legs and you don't want anything in your house to fall on you. Um, you know, let's think the, the bookcases are falling, maybe the light fittings are coming out of the ceiling, um, maybe the cat has just been thrown across the room. You need something above your head, so hiding under a table is a good idea. Um, or, as this guy here is, uh, this guy uh, is here, he's kind of holding on to something, making sure that he's stable. Um, standing in the, in the doorway is usually good, because there's usually a strong lintel overhead, which is going to keep keep you uh, protected as things start to crack up um, but yes a six is is difficult at the top of six we're looking at you know quite significant damage to your houses if they're not particularly well built a seven is like oh dear oh dear my city is crumbling um, and then it can go up to eight to nine and beyond um, I don't think we've ever had one that's hit ten before uh, not in recorded history we have had uh, one in a few years ago in Japan that was a 9.2, I believe, which I think is the biggest recorded earthquake. Um, that earthquake was so big in Japan that it actually very slightly moved the Earth off of its axis. The entire planet shifted on its axis because of an earthquake, um, which is crazy when you think about it. You know, that's so powerful that the entire planet moved. Just tilted ever so slightly i mean you don't really notice it but our planet is slightly differently oriented orientated now than it was before that earthquake so there you go um earthquakes can be pretty devastating and that's a nine yeah now as you'll see the ones that we've had today in greece they're all pretty pretty low uh, a couple of threes or a few threes um uh, so people might start to be feeling them now unfortunately if we go back to saturday though here we go um, so this is the 2nd of May, this Saturday. Um, there was an earthquake out at sea. You can see just below Crete here. Um, there was an earthquake that was a 6.6 .6 magnitude, which if there had been people out there in the sea, that would have been a pretty dangerous one. Now, it has spread. You can see the here that it's going. This is southern Greece, Crete here, I believe. Um, the earthquake was felt in Turkey. It's all the way over here. Um, in Egypt, which is down to the south, um, Greece, which is here itself, and Libya, North Africa over here. So it was a huge earthquake. Luckily, it's a huge earthquake that's happening out at sea. So by the time that earthquake has hit land, uh, Crete would have been the most, you can see that that's the area that's been hit the most here. By the time it's been hit, um, the earthquake isn't quite as strong. So they probably would have felt it uh, as more of a two or a three than a six. But, you know, if that earthquake had help, happened um, directly on a, a major city or something or, or a town, then houses would have crumbled and fallen. Um, I'm sure there are some octopi who were quite disturbed by the shaking, but other than that, we're all right. Um, now, just to give you an idea, here is a map of earthquakes that have happened in the world in the last 24 hours. Um, so you can see they're happening all the time, yeah? Most of these pretty small. Um, but our map here is really useful because it can show us the places where these, um, these earthquakes are happening. And they're happening on the lines between tectonic plates. That's the key. So, oh yeah, that's a good point, uh, Kyle. Um, yeah, if, if you were a fisherman out in the sea, you could have been affected by it. Um, thankfully, water kind of, uh, you know, can buffer you from the effects. It's worse to be on, on solid ground when it's shaking than on the water. The water will shake around, but it probably won't be too severe. They can, of course, when earthquakes happen out at sea, cause tsunamis. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there, there wasn't one of those on Saturday. Um, a tsunami is a huge tidal wave caused by an earthquake, which can then hit the shore and cause untold damage um uh so yes there yes there you go um ah some, joshua is telling me that some animals can sense earthquakes before they happen and that could make sense because 
well, as we'll see, earthquakes that they actually start way down in the ground, and maybe animals can pick up on that, uh, on on the vibrations better than we can, or maybe perhaps earthquakes have a sound. Maybe they kind of rev up, um, and as they're revving up, animals can hear it, but we can't. I think that might be silly. Hmm. Um, and yes, of course, the effects of an earthquake all depend on how severe the, the earthquakes are. So in the last 24 hours, we've had earthquakes all around here. Um, uh, let's see, we've had uh, quite a few in Mexico. There's a bit, a few overlapping here. We've got a few overlapping in Greece. That's our, our border here. Um, there's been some further down in South, uh, South America. And we've, there's always ha a lot happening over in Asia. We can see here's Japan under here, uh, Indonesia down into New Zealand over here. So these earthquakes are always being picked up by machines. The, the, the website that, that logs all these things, it's just taking automatic readings um, from uh, uh, machines that have been placed all around uh, the world to pick up on these uh, vibrations under the ground. And the vast majority of these earthquakes are barely noticeable. You know, the machines are picking them up, people aren't noticing, um, or they're noticing low rumbles, which, you know, if you're living in Mexico or Japan or Indonesia, certain parts of Indonesia, you're probably quite used to just the odd rumble every day. It doesn't really make much difference, you know. Um, so we can see in Europe, our earthquakes are pretty, you know, we haven't had many, only in, a, in and around Greece over here. Um, now, it's these red lines that are important. These red lines are the major plate boundaries on our planet, um, which, if you're unsure, um, if you imagine, if we go down and we look at our planet, if we think of our planet like a boiled egg, yeah, it's got a smooth shell around it. Now, if we hit that boiled egg with a spoon, just gently tap it, the, the shell cracks up into these big pieces, doesn't it? Um, and that's what our Earth is like. Um, each piece of shell, if you like, of our Earth's surface is uh, broken up and separated from the rest. Okay, so we're not on a solid planet here. We're on a load of broken bits of shell, if you like. Now, those pieces of shell are not still because they're not on solid ground. Um, our, the ground that we think of as solid is actually floating around on a humongous sea of magma, molten rock, liquid rock, so hot it's runny. Hmm. Now, because they're floating around, um, even though to our eyes they're connected, um, they're, they're not, they're, they're separate and they're floating and every now and again they will move around each other in different ways. Some are pulling apart, some are pushing together, some are rubbing along aside each other. Um, uh, and the yolk of our planet would be the molten, well, first of all, the molten outer core, and then the solid, highly radioactive inner core, um, which is solid, superheated metal, which is, you know, that's the core of our, of our planet uh, that pulls, you know, that's the gravitational, uh, uh, I don't know, center, if you like, that's pulling us all towards it, holding us together. Um, so... These, these plates, they're moving around. If they move apart, they can cause volcanoes to um, appear, called shield volcanoes. Um, we'll, we'll look at them maybe in a future lesson. Um, if they move together, they can create mountain ranges or other kinds of volcanoes. Um, earthquakes are usually formed, not always, but the most typical way for an earthquake to be formed is shown here. Um, what happens with an earthquake is our plates, they are moving um, across each other, yeah, or, or past each other, sorry, is probably a better way to put it. Um, yes, Captain Toad has noticed that Iceland is a danger zone. It is, Iceland is a particularly highly volcanic area. Um, Iceland is made up of volcanoes, that's why it exists, of volcanoes that have erupted and poked up out of the sea, and voila, you have Iceland, yes. Um, but our earthquakes, they're forming as the plates move past each other. Now, the plates, they're not smooth, if they were smooth, then the whole world would just sort of gently go wah, 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 as they passed by. It doesn't work like that. Um, uh, we've got to imagine they're kind of jagged like teeth, like this. Yeah. So for most of the time, the plates aren't moving because they're caught on each other. Yeah. Now, um, because the plates, they can't ever stay still. They're always moving very, very slowly, but they're always moving. For a while, 
the jagged nature of the two plates will hold each other firm. You know, they, they won't move. But pressure will build up because one will be trying to move one way and one will be trying to move the other way. They're trying to move past each other. And so that pressure will build and build and build until suddenly, at one particular moment, the pressure cannot build anymore. You know, it's just got to move and woof, your plates will move past each other. When this happens, that's when we feel a volcano, uh, an, uh, an earthquake, not a volcano. Now, depending on where this happens and how strong that release is, that makes a difference as to what, how strong we feel the, the earthquake. Um, so we have something called the focus. The focus is the point where the earthquake starts. Now, if that's really low, deep in the ground, then by the time those shock waves of kinetic energy, by the time they hit the surface, they're going to be quite dull. We're not going to feel them very much. So if uh, the perfect situation is to have earthquakes that start really, really low down in the ground, um, because then they don't hurt us. Um, the area, if we were going to draw an imaginary line from the focus of an earthquake up here to uh, the surface, we would call that the epicenter. So if I was standing here when an earthquake happened below the ground, that's where I'd feel it most. That would be the strongest magnitude right there. Now, the shock waves of energy would then spread out in great big rings like the ripple of a pool. And each, each moment that they spread away, they're going to get less and less powerful. So if our epicenter is on land, we're going to feel that earthquake really quite powerfully. We could do it, it's, assuming it's a powerful earthquake. But if that's out in the ocean or out in the sea, we're not going to feel it so much because by the time it gets to the shore, like our earthquake on Saturday, it's going to be quite, uh, quite gentle. Yeah, we're not going to notice it so much. Um, now, Grace asks, can you see the crack? Sometimes in extreme uh, earthquakes, you can. The very ground will crack open uh, like in a cartoon. Um, and this can be, be really bad, especially in places like a city. You know, if you imagine your train line suddenly opens up or a bridge collapses because you know, one side of the bridge was on one side of the crack, the other on the other, and it's just crum, the whole thing falls and collapses. Um, uh, but often if it's a small earthquake, then you won't notice any visible cracks. Um, you know, definitely does, can happen. So what we need to make sure that earthquakes are not too powerful, what we hope for is that the focus is way down deep and that our epicenter is away from human people. You do, the worst case scenario would be a focus that's near the surface, so it's hitting really powerfully with an epicenter in like the middle of a big city like Tokyo or Athens or something. Um, and that's what, what leads to, to really powerful and dangerous earthquakes. Um, the last really powerful earthquake, I think, hit in about, hmm, I was looking at this morning, I think 2008, something like that, in Athens. It might have been 2014. I forget my dates. Um, but they're, they're, every now and again, there are powerful earthquakes in Greece that will destroy buildings. Uh, thankfully, not this weekend and not today. Um, can you stop an earthquake? That's a really good question. The answer is no. There is no way to stop an earthquake. The only thing we can do is predict them. So we can have machines running all the time that tells us when the rumbles start. And so the, the best thing we can do is warn the people and say, look, it looks like there's going to be a big earthquake in the next 24 hours. Maybe you should you know, be careful. But no, we can't stop them. The earth is way more powerful than we are. If it wants to shudder and shake, it's going to for sure. Um, uh, let's, see, let's see if there's any more. <laughs> Mega Gengar is in Singapore, so yes, uh, you would be safe in Singapore, I guess. I don't, I don't know if there's any earthquakes in Singapore today. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, what is the population of Greece, asks Isabel. That's a good question. Let me see if I can find out for you. Population of Greece coming right up. Here we go. We don't usually look at the population figures, do we? Um, Thankfully, this is an easy thing to find out. 10.72 million people. So just over 10 million people. To give you some idea of uh, how that compares to the UK, the UK has a population of about 69 million people altogether. 55 million of those are in England. So, you know, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, they share out the rest. Um, uh, so 10 million is a pretty small country in terms of population. Um, to give you an idea as well, I mean, I know there's some people from India here. Um, in India, the population is over a billion. So you could fit many, many Greeks into uh, India many times over. There you go. Uh, yes, I can write that down. Okay, so um, our population, let me see. Uh, let's bring this over here. 
we'll leave our earthquakes for a time. Um, so population of Greece. I don't know why my pen is so thick today. Let's try and make that a bit uh, more thin. Here we go. Is 10 point, or what did I say? Oh, 10.7 million. There you go. 10.7 million. Um, UK, at my last I checked, was about 69 million altogether. That's England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Uh, China is at the moment on about 1.4 billion. Um, and India, I believe, is about 1.1 billion at the moment. Uh, they're growing bigger and bigger. There's only two countries in the world that have a population of over a billion, and that's India and China. So those are our, those are our monsters. Now, to give you an idea, of the population of Greece, 10 million. Um, the population of Tokyo, which is the capital city of Japan, is just over 30 million. Yeah. So there's three times as many people living in Tokyo, one city, than there is in the entirety of Greece. That's all the islands combined. Yeah. So some places um, have a lot of people living in them. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tokyo is the most densely populated city on earth, which means that it has the most people fit in there. It's huge. It's the biggest city on our planet. And there are three times as many people living in just that city than there are in the entirety of Greece. In fact, there are more people that live in Tokyo than in the whole of Australia. Wow. Australia, I believe, has a population of about 20 million people. And Australia is huge, but they're all spread out. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, well, when we uh, get to some of our bigger countries, we'll look more at population, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll, wait, I'll hold that on the screen just for a second if people are taking notes on that. Um, oh, hi, Iona says, hello to Josh and to Heidi. Hello, she says. <laughs> uh, oh, good question. Why are there so many people in China and India? There's lots of reasons for that. Lots of reasons. Um, we could look at birth rates. Um, we can look at, you know, the uh, ease of resources or agriculture and things like that as well. Um, uh, a good question here from Super Gerbilis or Super Gerbil, sorry, I was trying to read that in Latin for some reason. Um, yes, you could get killed in an earthquake, and unfortunately, many, many people do. Um, uh, next week, we're going to Haiti, because Haiti is one of my favourite countries uh, to look at in geography, and we're going, we'll, we'll have a look at an earthquake in Haiti, which sadly did kill a lot of people, um, uh, and we'll compare that to some other places, maybe. So yes, uh, more on that next time, for sure. Hmm. <laughs> all right so uh let's uh we'll leave our physical geography behind because we're we're running out of time and we, we haven't even got to the animals yet <gasps> oh dear um time flies when you're talking about greece so let's have a look at some greek animals let's start with the national animal of greece here it is the dolphin oh. yes the dolphin is the national animal of greece and I thought, because we haven't really looked at sea creatures yet, I thought we'd take it, we'll, uh, we'd keep the land animals away today. And since our national animal is an aquatic beastie, we would have a look at some others. So here, I believe this is a bottlenose dolphin, as far as I'm aware. Um, and yes, as well, I am with you. Uh, dolphins are amazing. They are so cute. Um, uh, and so the dolphin is the national animal of Greece. I mean, it links to ancient Greek history, to the Greek gods and goddesses. Dolphins were always seen as a, as a lucky symbol. So it makes sense that if you're going to pick a national animal um, and you are Greek, then the dolphin would certainly be top of the list. Hmm. But they're not the only creatures that live in the Mediterranean Sea around Greece. I've picked just a few here. Now, here we have an octopus. I believe this is just a common octopus, um, t uh, this picture taken just off the coast of Greece somewhere. Um, uh, now, octopus and our next animal are eaten quite large, uh, largely in Greece. Now, as far as I know, the Greeks don't eat dolphins, but they will quite happily eat octopi. And this little creature here, a squid. Here's a Greek gentleman who's caught a squid. Hey, I caught a squid! Hey! Um, that's my Greek accent. It's not very good, is it? Um, but he looks pretty happy with himself. He's got himself a squid there. Um, uh, so another good food to eat. Uh, I'm sure some of you out there will have eaten octopi and squid. Um, oh, let's get our tectonics out of the way. Here we go. Go away, Richter scale. Here we have some different creatures that live in the sea as well. We've got a scorpion fish up here. 
we've got a very colorful wrasse, I believe this is as well, and a moray eel, um, which can be quite dangerous. You wouldn't want to be bitten by a moray eel. Take your finger right off, they will. Um, so, I mean, this is just a very small selection, of course, of the fish that live around Greece. There are many different cool fish. Um, a moray eel, let me write that down. Um, here we are. Moray eel. This is the Mediterranean. Oh, don't want that many e's. This is the Mediterranean moray eel. There are other eels, uh, moray eels, I believe, in different countries. They have like different, uh, different uh, types of eel, but yeah, this this is one that's been found in the Mediterranean, and you can see that lovely blue colour on it, and that really cool sort of patterning. Uh, they're they're a bit like a snake. Um, and, and our two fishes here, or two, yeah, two fishes, that works. Um, we've got our scorpion fish. And we've got our ras. There we are. I think that's how you spell ras. I mean, I'm not a fish expert, of course. Oh, I should use the sparkly pen next time, couldn't I? <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, no, it's definitely spelled with a W, uh, Kai. But um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, maybe I've got the S's wrong. I can never be sure. Uh, yeah, the scorpion fish, I believe, is quite uh, dangerous. I believe they have some some nasty stuff in those spines of theirs. Um, oh, good question. Which country has a national animal that's a polar bear? As far as I'm aware, none. None that I can think of. And none of the Scandinavian countries, for sure. Nor does Canada. Um, nor does Russia. So I think that's pretty much all the countries that polar bears would live in. Um, so I don't think anyone has a polar bear as a national animal. Poor old polar bear. Um, all right, so we will move on from our wildlife and we'll take a quick look at what the government of Greece is like. Uh, here we are. So we're going to start with the prime minister of Greece here. The man who, uh, this man, and I'm going to have a go at, at saying his name, but it's tricky. All right, so bear with me here. Uh, Kyrakos Mitsotakis. Mitsotakis? Mm. This fella, Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister to you. Um, this guy is um, the Prime Minister of Greece, which means he has been democratically elected. It is a democracy. There are elections that take place. And this man won the last election um, in 2019. Now, he has been, uh, he is, uh, as we'll see with the money, a bit uh, concerned at the moment. Um, his country, Greece, is just coming out of lockdown. They are easing the lockdown off, and he's very proud of his country. I, I read a news article about him this morning saying he's very proud of his country because they have stayed in lockdown, and now they're coming out, and it seems that they have defeated the virus. We'll have to wait and see, won't we? But he's feeling pretty confident about it. Um, oh, here we are. Thank you, Grace. Kyrakos Mitsotake is... Mm, that's, how, that's how Grace is pronouncing it. I like it. <laughs> now, in Greece, there isn't just a prime minister there is also a president. Now, the president is kind of like our queen, um, doesn't really do anything in terms of laws and things. They're more of a figurehead, and they are elected too. Um, and our current president, who took office just in January this year, is quite special because she's the first ever female president of Greece. And her name is Katerina Sakalarapoulou. Uh-huh. I'm sticking with it. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see her looking quite serious. She's looking quite serious in this picture because she is traditionally, her job has been as a grand high judge, um, but she has now been voted as the president. So she gets to go to all the big formal dinners and potentially meet other world leaders and do all that kind of stuff. Um, and she's a very intelligent woman, but I don't think she has any say in the laws. That's the prime minister's job in Greece. Yeah. In fact, I believe she is called, uh, her official title is the President of the Hellenic Republic, um, because the Hellenic world is what uh, ancient Greece was called. So she's got that link to the past as well. Um, no aristocracy. Used to have an aristocracy until the Civil War. Um, what year was the Civil War? It was just after World War II. Um, now, the civil, they definitely did have a royal family because our very own Prince Philip, the husband of our queen, used to be uh, the Prince of Greece. His dad was the King of Greece. Um, but no, they don't have a monarchy anymore. That, that's gone. Um, you know, civil wars will do that for you, I assume. Um, so there you go. 
<laughs> yes, I, I bet you, I, I'm sorry, some people do miss having the public chat on, but really it's, it, it goes crazy, so it's best to keep it off. Um, uh, Rock is mentioning some kind of tennis player. Hmm. Now, um, over here we can have a look at the thing that we've all been waiting for, our GDP per capita. Woo, where does Greece fit in? So our scoreboard at the moment, we've got lots of countries on here. We've now got to G in our alphabet. And of course, we always have the UK just as a, as a benchmark here. Unfortunately, Greece is, is a bit far down here. Uh, Greece has had some uh, real uh, problems economically in the last few years. We'll see that the uh, that around 2010, um, the uh, the money in Greece really started to go down. Uh, we had a world recession in about 2008, 2009, and you'll see that Greece went down. In fact, at this time, most countries went down some, um, but Greece has gone down, and it's only now really just starting to get back on its feet, and people are there starting to get a bit richer now. Um, now, uh, seven weeks, uh, Asma, because uh, we haven't done the UK, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven countries we've done so far. This is week seven. Whew. God, we've been on a journey, haven't we? Now, if we're going to look at that in terms of US dollars per person per capita, well, that was, means the same thing. Um, in England, in Britain, we're on 42,920 US dollars per person per year on average. Um, whereas in Greece, it's just under half that, only $20,000 per person per year on average. So it is a relatively poor country. Now, have to bear in mind that I say relatively poor compared to us and countries like Australia and Denmark, but you know, still above the average wages in China and Brazil and way above Ethiopia, which is right down the bottom here. You know, uh, Ethiopia, really the only developing country that we've looked at so far. Uh, these two are emerging and Greece would fit in the category with these as a developed country. Um, a poorer developed country, but still pretty developed. So we're starting to see our three bands really come together here. Uh, next week, like I say, we're going to Haiti, which is going to be another developing, a very poor country. Okay, uh, The green line here is Brazil, Yeah, uh, for those asking. Um, ah, now, it'd be interesting. There's a good question from our Greek friend in the chat. Um, uh, will GDP go down? I think, yes, uh, GDP has fallen. Um, in China so far this year, GDP has gone down by about a quarter, 25% alone. Now, that could come back. It might be that when the life gets back to normal, all the companies will just start making stuff and making more money and we will you know, be back to normal by the end of the year. Or it might be that our, the GDP per capita just goes down all over the world. So we'll have to wait and see, won't we? Um, those of you with an economic head on your shoulders, have a think. Uh, you know, start your predictions now. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a gambling game, really, trying to figure out what the market's going to do. But I've got a figure here for Greece, 20%. Uh, the Greek economy, the, the, the money that comes into Greece, is reliant 20% on money from tourism. So one out of every five pounds that is spent in Greece comes from tourists. Now, the virus is not a good... Uh, good not good news for tourism, because of course no one's going on holiday right now, which means that Greece, if this continues, could lose 20% of its money, which is why, just yesterday, the Greek Prime Minister the guy with that name that I cannot pronounce, he said that they're hoping to open up all the tourists and the holiday places and the hotels by the 1st of July. Now, the problem is that might work, but will anyone go? Mm, we'll have to wait and see. So Greece is in quite a precarious position because 20% of its money comes from people visiting the country. And if they're not visiting, then we have problems. So watch this space. Hmm. Right, we're going to zap down to the culture. Let's see. Here we go. Make it tiny and then make it big. So uh, the first thing we're going to mention for Greek culture is olives. Yeah, uh, people out there, I'm sure some of you like eating olives. I'm sure a lot of you use olive oil in cooking and things. Um, olives are a big thing in Greece, uh, both, you know, in, in ancient times, they had a very important uh, effect. They were very uh, sought after. People would use the olive oil to rub all over themselves before they wrestled. Um, people would drink the stuff, cook with the stuff, wash with the stuff. Uh, you would, yeah, you would use olive oil for washing in ancient Greece. Um, 
So olives are a really important crop um, and Greece is absolutely full of them. I believe that the, this particular olive grove, you can see the olive trees here, these are all olive trees. Um, this is in Crete, this particular photo is taken. But uh, yeah, olives are an important part of the Mediterranean diet. So if we're talking about the food in Greece, we would talk about uh, olives um, and lots of seafood, lots of octopi, squid, things like that. Um, and lots of vegetables, of course. Uh, quite a healthy place if you're going to eat a uh, uh, they, they do say that a Mediterranean diet might be the diet that you know makes people live longest because uh, partly because of all that olive oil but well, you know, how true that is it's difficult to say um, oh rock I don't know what the site is called I'll, I'll see if I can find out for you um, now the next thing I want to talk about culture is the very specific type of Christianity that is found in Greece because Greece Greece is majoritively a an orthodox country um, I don't think we've been to an orthodox country yet so I thought it might be worth just pointing out a few differences between orthodox Christianity and other types now when we looked at France that's traditionally a Catholic country has no official religion but it is a Catholic country majoritively when we looked at Denmark that's a Protestant country um, so different countries have different flavours of, of Christianity going on in them. Of course, a lot of countries in the world are not Christian at all. Um, hmm, have we looked at any non-Christian ones yet? No, Ethiopia has its own kind of Christianity, which is more closely linked to Orthodox, but it isn't Orthodox. It's its own thing again. So um, different countries will have different groups of Christians in them. How do you spell Orthodox? That's a good question. Uh, uh, Shelley, sorry. Let's see, where's my pen? Here we go. Or... Oh, hang on, not like that. Uh, or, though, docs. There we are. Now, orthodox just kind of means standard. And the reason we would call it the standard Christianity is because if we think of the history of the religion, um, the first, like, original type of Christianity, if you like, would have been the orthodox lot. Um, then they split off from the Roman Catholic Church, who become uh, Catholicism. Uh, when the Roman Empire splits, we really see that difference starting to form because Greece was part of what we call the Byz Byzantine Empire. Um, uh, so we have two types of Christianity from then on. The Orthodox in the East, places like Russia, Greece, Turkey back then. Uh, not so many Orthodox Christians left in Turkey. Uh, that's a majority of the Muslim country now. Um, over in the West, places like Italy, Britain, France, Spain, they became Catholic. And then later in history, much later in history, there was another split between Protestants and Catholics. So we end up with three big flavours of Christianity. Now, uh, I thought I'd focus on today for the Orthodox, just the difference in how they do the Eucharist. So if we know our Christian stories, um, just before Jesus died, he had a meal his last supper just before he was killed on the cross um, and he met up with all his his best disciples here all his best buds and they had a meal and Jesus he's there and he's eating some bread and he's drinking some wine and he says to them oi fellas that's not a direct quote uh, in in the bible it's said far more sensibly than that but he says oi fellas when you eat the bread think of my body and when you drink wine think of my blood and they're all like cool yeah okay that sounds important yeah and it is kind of important um in christianity it's a sacrament it's something that brings people together with their god so if you eat the bread and you drink the wine um it brings you closer to jesus now um and to god yeah um it, it is in a way it's grape juice i suppose because wine is made out of grapes but it is alcoholic grape juice so there you go um so orthodox christians just like Protestants and Catholics, they believe in the Eucharist, eating blood, uh, eating bread, sorry, and drinking wine, and they represent the body and blood of Christ. Now, Catholics, they believe that uh, when you eat the bread and drink the wine, it literally becomes, in your tummy, it becomes blood and body. Protestants say no. No, it doesn't literally become that. It just symbolizes. It kind of counts as bl blood and body, um, but it isn't actually it. So that's one big difference between those two groups of Christians. Um, Orthodox as a word just means uh, the standard, the average, the normal, if you like. So, you know, obviously Catholics and Protestants would not say that Orthodox was Orthodox. They would say it was quite unorthodox. Um, but you can also look at it as maybe the traditional. Yeah, so that, that's, what, that's kind of what the word Orthodox means in this context. So if the Catholic people, they believe that wine turns into blood, 
And Protestants think that wine does not turn into blood, but it helps us remember the blood. Orthodox, they kind of go in the middle and they say, when you drink that wine, it is both wine and blood. And when you eat the bread, it is both bread and it is body. Ooh, so they're kind of in the middle there. Um, now, the Orthodox Church in Greece is led by the Grand Patriarch. This is him at the moment. This is the current Grand Patriarch, he of the awesome beard and hat. Um, and he is called Bartholomew I. That's his uh, patriarch name. Um, there are lots of patriarchs of different types of Orthodox. There's a Russian patriarch and a, uh, Ethiopian patriarchs and things like that. Um, but this one, he's the, he's the main man in Greece. So if we're kind of thinking, you know, the Pope, he's kind of the closest thing they would have to a Pope, the leader of the church. And Orthodox churches are a bit different from other churches because they each Orthodox church will have an iconostasis in it, which is a wall, a dividing wall, where the priest will be behind the wall to do a lot of the holy things and will come out through this big door, these, these big gates here. They will come out at special times and then they will talk to the audience, the congregation. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know how you become a patriarch. I think you have to work your way up through most of your life to get there. And he does look a bit like Father Christmas, but I like his I like his, his style a bit more than Father Christmas. You know, Father Christmas just does the red, a bit boring. This guy's gone for the gold. Mm -hmm. He knows what he's up to. Um, so yes, the priests will come out from behind the iconostasis and they will give people the bread and the wine um, really help. Uh, and they then that will be eaten in remembrance of Jesus. Um, the thing I like about it though, is that as this is happening, as the priests are behind there, cutting up the bread, stirring the wine with their special wine spoon, um, the congregation sing a song about how they would like to be like cherubs. That's the traditional song. I'd like to be a cherub, which is a fat baby angel. Ooh, yeah. Very holy, very pure. Mm, there you go. So that's a, that's a bit of a signpost to Orthodox Christianity. We could go on for that for, for hours, but you know, there you are. That's a little bit of, of the religion that we might find there. Now also, according to somebody called Rock, there's also somebody who plays tennis from Greece. His name is Stephanos uh, Sitsisipas, maybe, I don't know. Um, uh, and this guy, I don't really know much about sport. You know this by now. Um, apparently he's good at tennis. He's saying, hey, you, I, I hit the ball. The ball is going over the net. I win. I win a point. Yay. Oh, that's again my Greek accent. I apologize to those Greeks out there if that doesn't really fit. But he's really excited. Hey, there you go. Um, so, yeah, they play tennis. I mean, there we go. Um, and I couldn't leave it without showing you this picture here as well, because this is incredible. Because although I've just said that most people in Greece are... Uh, Orthodox Christians, there is a growing number of people who are in fact what we call Neo-Hellenists. And well, you can probably tell from the picture, this is a very modern picture. They're walking past some kind of clothes shop here, if I move myself over to this side. Um, this was taken uh, last year, I believe, um, in Athens. And these are people who still worship the old gods. They are doing a procession um, they worship Zeus and Aphrodite and Athena and all the old gods. Um, so even though most people are Christian now, there are some people in Greece who keep the old traditions alive. It looks like a very serious procession here, doesn't it? They all look very, very serious yes, as they march along, uh, probably worshipping uh, Athena or someone at this point. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but it, yeah, nice to know that, that the old cultures are still alive, even if not that many people um, uh, follow them. There are people out there who will follow the old ways. <laughs> um, oh, a good question. Can you be a patriarch if you're a girl? No, the very word patriarch means father. So no, not happening, I'm afraid. As you can see, though, um, our neo-Hellenists here, they seem to be mainly women in this particular picture. So uh, maybe that it's slightly more equal there. Maybe you can, I mean, you could have female priestesses in ancient Greece, so yeah, maybe. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, why are they holding lamps, Lewis? I assume because it's just because they're, well, they're at night time and they're doing this procession, a holy parade for their gods. So I imagine that the, the torches you know, make it look cool and they also must have some religious significance to Zeus or something. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Heartwarming indeed. A nice place to end it for today. 
So guys, next time, I uh, tomorrow, we will have a look at ancient Mycenae. And on Friday, we'll be going on a bit of an odyssey, a journey across the sea. So thank you very much for joining me today. And I hope to see you all very, very soon. Have a good one. Adios, amigos.